Hello, friend and colleague. It's Nikki from Full Voice on our show, episode 192 of the Full Voice podcast. My guest is Nashville composer and arranger Garrett Breeze. He is famous for his extensive catalog of choral and competitive show choir music. Garrett is discussing his journey, his creative process, and how he thrives in this unique musical niche. We also dive into his resources for composers, arrangers, and songwriters, namely his podcast, Selling Sheet Music, and his arranging courses. Inspiration for everyone in the music industry, right here on the Full Voice Podcast. Hello, hello, thank you, and welcome Welcome. We're almost at 200 episodes. I don't know how I feel about that. Excited? Maybe? Oh my goodness. Anyhow, friends, uh, my name is Nikki, if we have not met from Full Voice Music, and I am so excited. I have an amazing guest with, he's so inspiring. We had a great conversation. I learned so much talking to Garrett. Before I bring him on the show, I want to just get everybody caught up with what's happening at Full Voice Music. We've got a couple of fun announcements. First and foremost, um, we have been spending some time um, putting together our YouTube channel and our our podcasts. If you prefer to listen on YouTube, apparently that's a thing. Um, You can now uh, go to our YouTube page, Full Voice Music, and you can listen to the podcast. Now I will tell you, future podcasts will be video uh, podcasts, but I'm this is what we're doing. We're actually asking our guests. We're asking our guests what they would prefer if they want to be on video or if they prefer to have an audio uh, um, interview. Uh, It's important that our guests feel comfortable. So we want to make sure that they do by giving them that option. But you can either listen and or watch our videos on YouTube. So Full Voice Music, check out our YouTube channel. You can also find our lyric videos there. If you're looking for new music or if you want a tool to help your students learn their music, please check that out. And I also wanted to let teachers know, because this was always an issue for me when I was teaching and using YouTube as a teaching tool. All of our lyric videos uh, are kid-friendly content, which means that no inappropriate commercials will come up, ads will come up. It has to be kid-friendly. So that was really important to us. That was actually one of the reasons why we we didn't kind of get involved with YouTube in the beginning was just you didn't have any control over what kind of ads would pop up. So, uh, so yes, if you're looking for our lyric videos, if you're looking to discover some new children's music, um, there's the lyrics videos are up there. Our karaoke videos are up there for Sushi Song, uh, for the Itty Bitty Kitty Unicorn, all of that stuff is up there. And our podcasts are going to be uploaded and housed there from now on. So, uh, but I also wanted to tell everybody about our exciting new feature that just, we had our first one, we had our live office hours. It was so much fun. So live office hours is a free casual Zoom call and you have to register for it. It's free. Uh, And my first topic was helping students uh, with singing confidence and developing pitch accuracy. I had 80 people register for that. I had two pages of questions and I, uh, I did a presentation all about uh, helping students and going from very, very beginner stages with a whole bunch of teaching strategies. You can check out our first office hours on our YouTube channel. Now, if you would like to participate, if you would like to be part of a live office hour, a couple things. Uh, You want to sign up for our newsletter because that's how you're going to get notification and that's how you can register. Our next topic, friends, I'm so excited about this. Our next topic and our guest that will be doing our live office hours is the one and only Dr. Ginevra Williams. And our topic is everything you need to know about changing voice. So if you would like to register for that 
presentation. It is free. If you have a burning question that you would like to ask Dr. Williams about changing voice, be sure to go to our website, fullvoicemusic.com, sign up for our newsletter. And just so you know, I have better things to do with my time than to harass people on my mailing list. I do not, I do not send out a ton of emails. I just let you know when cool things are happening and when new products are available. And I share lots of fun ideas through the newsletter. So just in case you're worried about that. But if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll get notifications and you'll get a link to the registration for the live office hours number two, which will be happening in March. And we're still solidifying the date with Dr. Williams. But uh, once you get that link, you can sign up. You can uh, give me, uh, you can tell me what your question is. And then we're going to give all those questions to Ginevra and she's going to um, talk about them on live office hours. So I'm super excited about that. We had so much fun. And if you can't attend the live office hours, no problem. But for those people who do attend, we have prizes. We have prizes. We gave away uh, digital copies of some of our resources. So congratulations to Celestina and to Jasmine. They won the Songs and Studies Introductory B digital download. Um, it was so much fun. Friends, uh, please check it out if you'd like to participate fullvoicemusic.com. Uh, find the newsletter if you're not already, already signed up and you'll get notification for our next uh, live office hours. And if you are listening to this later on down the road, if you just visit our YouTube channel and subscribe to our YouTube channel, that's where all our office hour replays will be living. So there you go. YouTube has kind of been our focus for the last couple of months and we want to share all the good stuff happening at uh, here at Full Voice Music. Now, whew, let's get started. Let's dive into our uh, our uh, conversation. So uh, a little while ago last year, one of the one of the uh, topics that I did uh, on the podcast was about self-publishing. And uh, we here at Full Voice started very small. It was just Mim and I, and we self-published our books and grew slowly, but surely. Um, and there's a lot of things to navigate in publishing. And I covered a lot of those things in that podcast. But I got so many questions, so many questions from te uh, from teachers and, and people that listen to the podcast um, talking about selling your music and copyright. So I wanted to bring on a guest who has extensive knowledge about all of this and I couldn't have found a better guest. I'm so thrilled. So friends, uh, without further ado, Mr. Garrett Breeze. Welcome to the Full Voice Podcast, my special guest, Garrett Breeze. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Uh, How's the weather over there? Oh my gosh, I was just going to ask you because you were in Nashville and it looks really sunny where you are. So it's it's probably warm there, yes? Do you know what? Uh, we actually got six inches of snow last week and the place <gasps> shut down. We've had school canceled for six days. Church was canceled. Everything was canceled. This is like a once in a decade snowstorm for us. Oh, so it's just like being in Canada. <clears throat> don't you don't y'all know how to handle your snow? Up we there? do. We I mean, but yeah, we just we do we still get school canceled. I mean Well what is. happens what happens is they don't have plows here. Because it doesn't snow enough. And so everything comes down and then it rains and just freezes. And you basically, all the roads turn into just ice rinks. Oh, so as a thank you gift, I should send you a, a box of like hats and mitts and gloves. By the time this airs, I'm sure it will be 60 degrees and raining, you know, oh, okay. like normal. <laughs> well, Garrett, I am so... I'm so glad you're here. I have so many questions for you. I warned you prior to recording that you have such... You wear so many hats and there's so many things I need to know. But first and foremost, let's talk about let's talk about your um your composing, your arranging. I need to let my people know that you have a catalog, a massive catalog of over 1500 choral arrangements. So my question is, when do you sleep? 
ha, ha, ha. Never. I knew it. And you're a robot. Uh, I mean, it, so I have the advantage that a lot of people don't and that arranging is my job. I, mm. It's not my side gig. I'm not, I'm not teaching. I'm not performing. This is what I do. And so all day, every day, I'm arranging music. And so that lets me uh, put out a lot more material than most people who also have to uh, do other things. And I should also add that I have a team that helps me. I have some people that help transcribe music. I have some people that help with the formatting. Um, you know, I, I kind of outsource the non-creative parts of it. You know, if, if if somebody comes to me and they want an arrangement of something and they basically want it to sound exactly like the original, you know, like if there's published sheet music, I'll just go there and copy it in and start from that, you know, or if, or I have somebody transcribe it for me and then I just do the fun part and write the choral parts and it's done, you know? So I, 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 I do tend to think generally arranging goes by a lot quicker than composing from scratch because there's a lot less sitting and overthinking everything, you know, it, it kind of is what it is. And, and for me that helps speed things along, but but yeah, I mean, it's crazy. You're, you're not wrong. It's 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 a ridiculous <laughs> amount of music. <laughs> well, I have to say, looking at your website, I you know I, I I was celebrating all of our achievements at Full Voice, but then I was like, wow, okay, we've got we've got some catching up to do to Garrett. You're now you're now the the the. Uh, the uh, we've got a picture of you on the wall and it's like, if we're not being productive enough, I'm just going to point to what would Garrett do? <laughs> well, it, it's really a question of scale, right? I mean, I have a ton of music that sells a few copies. You probably have less music and you probably sell a gazillion copies, boatloads of, of copies, you know? So we probably ended up in about the same place. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Now I wanted to just, um, I want to, I want to talk show choirs. Of um, course. Uh, oh, more than a thousand uh, arrangements that you've done were specifically for sh competitive show choirs. I would love to know why is that your specialty? Well, how did you get into show choir arrangements? Sure. So show choir is the real life thing that the TV show Glee was based on. Mm. So if you go and watch that show, they actually name drop, you know, real life choirs and, and things like that. It's kind of, kind of little Easter eggs for those of us in, in the know. But um, it's 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 something that's actually really small relative to choral music in the United States. So in the in the U.S. in the U.S. choir music is largely concentrated at the school level. So high schools will have choirs that are associated with the school. And it happens during the school day, during classes. And it's just something that's developed mostly in the Midwest, like Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Iowa, Nebraska. You know, there's there's a few pockets on the East Coast, the Deep South, a little bit in SoCal. But, you know, we're, and, and in those pockets of the country, show choir has just developed into this massive thing. It, it's, it's sort of comparable to... I call it marching band for choir kids, you know? Right. So you're performing, sure. you're, you're performing a 15 to 20 minute set of music. It's arrangements of pop songs. It's choreographed. You have costumes and costume changes and lights and a band. And it's this really, really cool thing. And so, you know, you spend most of the fall semester putting all this music together and then, and then, yeah. and then in the winter, you're going out and competing. So you'll be five, six, seven weekends in a row going and competing against other schools and doing this set and getting feedback from the judges and making changes. And it's a really cool thing. And it's not something that I think most people heard about, but I just happened to be in one of those schools uh, in high school that had a show choir program, a really good one. And um, I was actually a trombone player. Wow. So okay. I, I was... So one day, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, Monica May just came to me and she said, you're doing a show choir band this year. I said, okay, great. I don't know what that is. And, and I just, and I just got hooked, you know? So I was playing in the band for this, for this show choir and, um, it just, it was so fun. And for me, it was really, really fascinating to see just the process of how everything comes together. I mean, you have professional choreographers coming and teaching, you have professional arrangers that are coming in and writing the charts and, and working with the band and, and it was just eye-opening to see how, you know, what I sort of considered at the time to be, you know, you know, pop music, blah, like that, you know, there's like, that's, 
I, I was kind of a pop music snob, right? Because I was into you know orchestra music and 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 jazz band and all that stuff. And to see the really cool, creative music that you could make out of these songs that I kind of thought were boring, it, it was really eye opening. Oh, I, I love so that. So anyway, I, I I never actually answered your question. So that that's that's show choir. Um, no, but basically, I was I w- I went to college thinking I would uh, grow up and be a, a film composer, doing the Hollywood thing. And I started arranging for my alma mater just as a side job in high school. So my teach my teacher asked me to arrange some charts for her. And then, you know, she would have a student teacher that would go get a job at another school and then they would hire me. And then it it just kind of spread organically to the point where I was like, you know what, this might actually be this might actually be a thing. You know, I could actually make a living doing this. And and I just love so many things about it. I, you know, the puzzle of putting things together and figuring out how to put your own spin on the song and just the flexibility of being able to work from home and and set my own schedule and, and, and fit that around other things I want to do in my life. It just, it ended up being a really great fit. And I think it worked to my advantage that it's uh, something that so few people know about, frankly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, when you were in high school, you started actually doing this arranging, and then you studied you studied um, media music for your right. for your bachelor's degree. So this is interesting. If you if you don't mind, for, well, first of all, what I wanted to say: show choir is not necessarily a thing that happens in Canada. So this is so. Oh no fascinating to learn about this but also like programs like media music what what is media music about at at the university level the term now is more commercial music right uh, commercial music programs it's basically hmm, how do i say this not offend anyone it's basically all it's basically all of the non-classical music lumped together Mm, okay so it's 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 songwriting it's film scoring it's audio engineering it's you know, music production, it's working with DAWs and, you know, microphones and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and every school does it, every school does it a little bit differently, but it is definitely a growing, um, a growing piece of, you know, university, uh, offerings, because I think more and more people are realizing that, um, if you want any sort of a career outside of education, you have to have this wide set of skills because you're either going to be you're either going to be teaching or you're going to be a freelancer. And if you're going to be a freelancer, it's not enough to just know one thing. You can't just be a composer. You also have to know how to handle yourself in a recording studio. You know how you need to know how to record things at home and and just all of this stuff. It's it's kind of overwhelming, honestly. Well, I love that there's these options though, right? Because, you know, back, I don't, I don't know, I'm dating myself, but back when I went to school, you had the only university options you had at the time were classical. And then if you wanted to take contemporary music or jazz music, that was at the community college. And you got mm. thrown a lot of shade for going to the community college, but, you know, those were working musicians that were, were successful, Right. So it's nice to know that there's more and more of these options out. So from your from your degree in uh, music media, you then went into commercial composition. And did that did that help to find your niche or was that even more options for you? Yeah. So actually, at that point, I was already doing quite a bit of arranging. And so my goal in getting that advanced degree was setting myself up for the future in case I ever wanted to teach. But it was also just giving myself more tools um, to handle the sort of odd jobs that pop up here and there. Because uh, in that master's program in particular, it was less focused on film scoring specifically, and more just on you know, music business, music production. So I took classes on entrepreneurship. I took classes on audio editing, songwriting, different styles of music, arranging. So it was just widening my skill set a little bit more. Um, it, for me personally, I mean, I basically encountered zero music technology until I until I got to college. So I was playing, I was playing constantly in you know band, orchestra, choir, all this stuff. 
I was really proficient on my instrument and I, I, I was, I was pretty good with finale, but I wasn't really exposed to any of that other stuff until I got to the collegiate level. So for me personally, I just felt that was kind of something I was lacking in my own skill set, And, and it was an excuse to move to Nashville, you know, to, to sort of position <laughs> myself in a music center. How long have you been in Nashville? We've been here nine years now. Oh, lovely. Lovely. Okay. Where, where did you come from? I grew up in Indianapolis. Oh, okay. So if you know where Chicago is, it's like two hours southeast of that. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Now, I I need to know, you collaborated with two huge uh, industry giants, and I know my listeners would love to know more about it. So you uh, collaborated with Kristen Chenoweth and with Michael W. Smith. How... How did these collaborations come about? And I want to know, I want to know all the things. <laughs> sure. Um, um, so Kristen Chenoweth a couple years ago came and did the big Christmas concert with the Tabernacle Choir in Salt Lake City. And so I was one of the, or I was one of the orchestrators on that concert. And, um, and so I was working with another composer and there was, uh, you know, there were there were a couple pieces of music that she sang on her own uh, and and Mac didn't want to do with them. And so we did the orchestrations for that, you know. Um, so I didn't actually work with Kristen, but I did work on music that she or I should say that accompanied her. So. Oh, wow. Um, and then, yeah. And then Michael W. Smith, that was um, that was a recent gig. Uh, I he did a concert tour um, through. Actually, I don't even know where it was. Cut that part. But anyway, um, and then Michael <laughs> W. Smith, he he did a concert tour that some friends of mine were producing, and they needed charts for the band to play. So a lot of time, so a lot of times, what happens is these artists will go on tour, but they'll be playing with, you know, uh, musicians that are not their crew, and right. so and and so they don't know the songs, and so a lot of times, someone like me will get hired to to just chart everything out for them. It's it's mostly chord symbols and notes, you know, play play an arpeggio here, or play block chords here, just kind of instructions to fill them in, especially in Nashville. A lot of people just play by ear. And so they just listen to the recording, take one look at the chord chart. And they're like, oh yeah, okay, I know what to do. You know, I know this song. Uh, but there's a lot of, and, and that's an interesting point to bring up. There's a lot of support staff behind any major artist, any major production. You know, you've got whole teams of people and so I'm just a small piece of the cog, you know. Is it challenging to work with these teams? I would imagine you're just uh, the the, and I guess it wouldn't be bureaucracy, but you're dealing with so many different people, managers, you know, all sorts of things. Is it challenging working with larger groups like this? Well, I don't really have to interact with the whole structure. I just work with the producers that hire me. Um, they're the ones that have to deal with all of the moving pieces. I'm just the sheet music guy, you know. So when somebody needs, when somebody need thing, when they need things charted in finale, I'm the guy. They call me. I do the job, and I don't really have to worry about much else except for, you know, uh, the fast turnaround. Because most of the time it's, hey, you know, we need this tomorrow, or we need this in two days, and you know, here's ten songs, and you kind of have to drop everything and get the job done. So that part of it is hard. But, but in terms of the, in terms of the complexities of the operation. Uh, no, not really. Mm. Now I was looking on your website, which by the way, is a wealth of information. And I, and so wonderfully put together. Um, when you're working with say the show choirs, you take commissions, like you have, you work directly with schools and, and how, do, how does that work? Like, do they just reach out and say, here's a song we want? Can you do your magic to it? Or you also have like your inventory of, of already done ones. So how does it work if somebody wants like a new arrangement? Absolutely. Well, at this point I have relationships with a, a number of choreographers that I, I I know that I work well with and we collaborate well together. And so most of the time I'm working with the same uh, creative team. But <clears throat> yeah, I mean, everyone does it a little differently, but it's uh, sometimes it's the director at the school wanting specific songs. Sometimes they're coming to me and saying, you know, what are your suggestions or we're designing it together. It's really all over the place. Um, but as you said, there is the existing catalog. So a lot of schools that 
are under more budgetary restraints. We'll we'll draw things from that um, list of songs, and then those that have the the funding to to create a custom show, you know, I'll work with them to uh, to put it all together. I will say it is um, it's not all about the size of the group because you know the more advanced groups they can make anything sound good a lot of times it's those smaller groups with the weird instrumentation or the odd number of voices you know they're the ones that really need the most arranging just to get it to sound the way it needs to interesting interesting i want to talk about your your work with your um selling sheet music podcast and and the services and information that you're offering composers and arrangers to get their music out there um what motivated you to get started in in helping others to sell their their compositions yeah so like we talked about i've been going you know uh gangbusters with the show choir thing for uh you know, a little more than 10 years now. And um, like everybody else, when the pandemic happened, that all kind of came to a crashing stop because my whole job was writing music for large groups of people that breathe on each other. And (laughs) so, um, you know, I had a lot of downtime and what I decided to do with that time was really focus on getting all of my non-show choir music you know, uh, cataloged and published mm-hmm. and available, whatever whatever terminology you want to use. I had all this stuff that I'd written, you know, in the past, but never really put out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was sort of my pandemic project to get all caught up on that. And, you know, here we are 2024 and I still haven't finished. But um, <laughs> I was going to ask, did you get done? <laughs> <laughs> but I just sort of came to realize just how much things in the industry were changing and nobody was talking about it. And, and it's, you know, it wasn't getting, it w- it's not getting taught in schools. It's not getting discussed. I mean, that's such a small, it's such a small uh, piece of the music industry, you know, sheet music publishing, but it touches so many other areas, as you've already alluded to. I mean, big professional acts need sheet music, uh, you know, school ensembles are using sheet music constantly. And I kind of, eventually settled on podcasting, frankly, because I hated being on camera. You know, I I thought my first, my first thought was, oh, I'll do the YouTube thing, you know, because that's where a lot of choral directors are are looking for their music these days. They're getting on YouTube and they're, you know, looking at this, the score previews. And, and so I was thinking, okay, how can I promote the YouTube channel better? Maybe I'll, you know, be one of those YouTubers. And, and, and I just, I, I couldn't hack it, you know? Uh, (laughs) I I hear you. And, and a lot of people will ask me, you know, how to, you know, I've got this, I've got this song I've written. How do I get it arranged? How do I get it published? You know, I was fielding all these questions and I thought, you know, if I just had the resources there in one place, I could just sort of, you know, send them the podcast rather than having to sit down and, and write an email for an hour every time explaining it all. So it, it just kind of, it just kind of grew out of that. And then the response to it was really great. I mean, so many of the people in the publishing industry, uh, responded to it positively and listeners and, and, and students in colleges and universities are eating this stuff up. I mean, if you're a composition student right now, uh, it's, it's crucial information because even if you do get a traditional publishing deal, which is a fantastic thing, you know, no publisher is going to take more than one or two of your pieces a year. And so the question then becomes, what do I do with all this other stuff? And, and you don't have to wait, you don't have to wait on other people to get that out there anymore. You can just do it yourself. And I think um, in the long term, that's going to prove out to be very valuable. When you're, when you're talking to people, to composers about publishing, um, one of the things that, that I, you know, that even at full voice, we talk about this a lot, navigating um, copyright, navigating uh, all the all of that how do you help people understand copyright do you dive into that with people sure um since we've been talking a lot about show choir i will just say that there is sort of a separate process for the schools to get licensing to do their their performances of the music that's kind of a different category 
than um, trying to publish arrangements of copyrighted music because those are those are those are one off licenses. So the schools will go to the publisher and say, you know, we want to do this show choir thing, and they'll say, great, give me money, and it's done, right? But it's just for them, and that's that's part of the reason I sort of started shifting gears towards my own self publishing because I have this great big catalog of show choir music, and I don't own any of it because it's somebody else's music, you know, it, it's, you know, I, I do a fantastic arrangement of Taylor Swift and, you know, but she's the one ultimately that owns that. Um, and that's the challenge for arrangers because you, you're more limited in what you can do uh, with your arrangements of copyrighted songs. There are some options. Uh, the easiest one is a service called Arrange Me. Um, that is That is a Hal Leonard program where they basically have this great big list of songs. And if anything, if, if the song you want to arrange is on that list, you can sell it through that service. And so, and so what happens, it's a little confusing because arrange me is not where people go to buy the music. That's sort of the composer interface, but, but as a composer, you would go to arrange me, you would look up the song, you would submit the song through their portal and then it goes for sale on sheetmusicplus.com and sheetmusicdirect.com. Right. That's all under Hal Leonard. That's like a, that's part of their services, yes? So, yeah, so arrangeme.com, that's a Hal Leonard um that's a Hal Leonard program and then Sheet Music Plus and Sheet Music Direct are both websites that they own and operate. So right. that is sort of the built-in distribution for that music. And so a lot of uh a lot of people are using it, but particularly educators because they can they can write something for their class to sing, you know, a song that kids want to do or something that's really popular, and they can they can do it in a way that's legal. Right. I should say, too, you also have the option of reaching out to the copyright owners directly. If you have a song that you want to arrange or that you want to uh, uh, publish yourself, um, there's nothing stopping you from going and asking permission from the people who wrote it. The hard part is figuring, the hard part is figuring out who wrote it because a lot of... A lot of these songs are written by teams of songwriters. And so they have, you know, there may be five or six writers on a song and they may each have their own publisher. So now you have, you know, 12 different entities that you have to go get sign off on it. But, uh, but, you know, if it's an independent songwriter, if it's somebody who's unsigned, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's one of the people on YouTube. uh, A lot of times they're more than willing to let you use their music. So um, I guess just be aware that it can be a pain to track everybody down and, and, you know, get them to respond to their emails and all that sort of stuff. But there is definitely a payoff financially to doing that because you're not ending up having to split your portion of the, of the sale price with as many people. When you are, when you're working, um, you've been commissioned or you're working with, uh, with a team, um, what what's the process? What's the process like? How you you've you've they've chosen a song, and uh, you've got choreographers, you've got their team. How, how do you get started? What what happens? I think it all starts with who you're writing for. You have to you have to understand how many singers there are. What are the voice types? You know, is it is it a tenor heavy group? Right, that never happens. But. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but you know, but but is it is it a younger group? Is it a is it a more experienced? Is it an older group, more experienced? Um, you know, even even so much as how much do they rehearse? You know, a lot of these groups are after school and they only do once a week. Um, but but you, you kind of start with with who is who are the children? You know, and and what types of music do they enjoy singing? And what types of music fit their voice? What makes them sound good? Um, and then when you're designing a show you kind of have to make some decisions thematically, you know, a lot of, a lot of show choirs are doing more elaborate sort of dramatic things. They'll have a a story that they're trying to tell, or they'll have a, um, you know, a theme or a lesson that they're trying to get across. Some show choirs are just picking fun songs and just going for the entertainment value. So you have to figure out what the purpose of the show is. And then at that point, the thing that really becomes the most crucial is just the pacing of the show and 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 arranging the songs in such a way that they fit the structure of the show you know you want an opening number that really hits with a bang you want some kind of a contrasting change of pace you know you you'll have a transition number maybe or a, a ballad where they just stand and sing and then you have your closer where you kind of wrap everything up and bring it all home so i think that's the thing that makes 
quote unquote show choir arranging different from just regular arranging is you have to really understand like in the show structure like what is the function of the arrangement and that's why it's harder to just grab something off the shelf that's published because there are published arrangements of of popular music for choirs but if it doesn't fit the the moment in the show then it doesn't really work right oh that's so exciting um i have a two-part question i know you've got a huge library but do you have like a favorite project that you've worked on recently? Like one that just was like set you on fire. And then my second question is, did you have a project that you wanted to set on fire? Cause it was such a nightmare <laughs> <laughs> without naming names, of course, but just. Mm. I'm terrible at picking favorites. I really am. <laughs> uh, it, it's that's, that's, that's just, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not really built. I'm one of those people. If you give me two choices and say, pick one, no problem. I got you. If you're like, tell me your favorite. I'm like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> any, any, well, you've also done, you've also done projects like you've written for video games and you've written for television. And what about those? Pro those must be completely different types of projects that, that are like a diff different from the show choirs. Yeah. You're getting like three podcast episodes out of this. Um, I know there's, there's, there's this whole um, side of the music, there's this whole side of the music industry no one talks about um, called production music, and basically, basically what it is is stock music for movie trailers, uh, TV shows, commercials. You know, a lot of the reality TV will use production music because they have these you know twenty episode seasons, and it's not really. I mean, it's not scripted, and so there's not necessarily the specific dramatic beats you have to hit. And so, anyway, there's just the there are these large music libraries out there, very creatively named, I might add. Um, <laughs> you know, they they have these great big catalogs of music, and then they go pitch them to shows, or shows come to them and and look for something to fit a specific beat. And so that's kind of one of my side hustles. When I get sick of writing choir music, I'll go do some instrumental underscore. You know, for one of these music libraries, and then occasionally things will get picked up and put into shows, and and it's really fun. And you find out like two years later, you know, because the way royalties are processed and paid is ridiculous. But um, <laughs> I've had the same experience with with jingles. Like uh, you audition, it's, for it's a exactly jingle, the same. Yep. And then two years later, you just get this check, and you're like, "What is this for?" And then you have to go and look up what you actually were used in. Yes, I, I've, I've experienced that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was the toilet paper commercial. Great, <laughs> right? I am, I am now the voice of toilet paper. Right? Yes. It, it happens. Um, what about um, you? I, 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 you have a course that you, you teach um, for uh, high school about arranging. And what I loved uh, about your your outline of it is I think a lot of people think that arranging is something that can only come at an advanced level but you're bringing it to in, and making it more accessible for younger musicians can you talk a little bit about that sure I think there are a lot of reasons that composition and arranging do not get taught in the schools at least not in America um, and probably the biggest reason is that the teachers are too busy trying to direct their ensembles that, you know, teach people how to play their instruments and all of that. So I'm not throwing shade at anyone uh, because of this, but I just had the realization that, you know, uh, if you don't go major in music at a university, you're probably never going to get taught how to arrange. So unless you're the type of person that's going to fiddle with it on your own, you're never going to get that opportunity. And the biggest reason I think people, we'll put it this way. I think there is a sense that you have to understand music theory first. You have to understand music notation first, you know, uh, before you can try arranging. And I just don't think that's accurate because if you, if you really take a step back and look at like, what is arranging and, and, and sort of open up the definition, it's not getting into finale and notating something, right? Like you can have, especially for singers, it's a lot easier for singers because they can just kind of come up with stuff on the fly and, 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 and ad lib it and listen to each other and improvise. And, and, and so you don't have to write things down to come up with good ideas. You can record them. You can, um, you can put these ideas in your students' heads at an early age, even middle school, 
you know, uh, they're smart enough to understand, oh, like the accompaniment for this is different. That's arranging, you know, or even even just shortening a song. But but and I don't want to sound like an old person, but I think that's kind of how young people, a lot of what happens online now with the memes and the TikToks and everything like that. There I go talking about the TikToks again. But, you know, you're taking a song and you're putting it in a totally new context. And that's mm-hmm. basically what we're doing when we arrange music. Yeah, I love that. I I love that because we we talk about that with some of our children's composers. And, and I mean, Donna Rodenizer was in the music education for 36 years. She says she's an advocate for teaching composition in kindergarten, you know, Like, like, it's just, it's, it's giving them the permission. I remember with working with a student once and we were trying to come up with a, a, an audition cut and she was like, well, you, you can do that. I'm like, what do you mean? Well, you can just take a part of the song. And I'm like, yes, of course you can. Like, sometimes it's just as simple as having the permission to, to change something. Right. There's, there's this, there's this mindset that comes with, um, a certain type of education where you just get to this point where it's like the composer is God and the composer's intent is everything. And if it's not on the page, you don't dare, you know, have your own interpretation. You can't change anything. And, 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 you know, I've, I've been in the dark, I've, I've gone over to the dark side for long enough now with commercial music that, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't bother me anymore, but I just think people get very fixated on what's on the page Sure. And, 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 and they don't give themselves permission to, to try things and to get out of their comfort zone. And it's just a different type of music education. It's not right or wrong, but, um, I personally find that it opens up a lot of doors when you can teach your students to be flexible and to Mm -hmm. be willing to make changes and to try different things. And, and, and that's really, I mean, as performers, right. We're, there's always a certain amount of decision making you have to do musically. Sure. You know, how, how am I going to take this crescendo or these dynamics or how, you know, where am I going to switch into my head voice and, and all that kind of stuff? You know, you have those sorts of interpretation decisions. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is don't limit yourself to just that because you can also now, depending on what you're doing, there may be some copyright implications, but, of course, um, of course. but for the, but for the most part, if you're not having to write anything down, it's legal. So what I, what I mean by that is when we talk about music copyright, really what we're talking about is a collection of different rights. So, uh, I've, heard, I've had it described as a bundle of sticks, right? So if you write a song, Nikki, you control all of the rights to the different ways that song can be used. Mm-hmm. So the, the right to record it is a stick. The right to notate it is this stick. The right to sync it up with a video and put it on TV, that's a stick, right? Every every different way you could possibly use the song is its own uh, license or its own permission, its right. own copyright. And so when I say you don't need to get permission to... So when I say you don't need to get permission because you're not writing something down, what I mean is if you buy the sheet music to a song and you decide to sing it a forte instead of a mezzo forte. You know what I mean? Like that's (laughs) right. You're not, you're not changing that music that you purchased. You are just, you're just going your own way. Right. Or if you were to listen to something on the radio and just figure out the parts and sing it without any sheet music, right? Like there's nothing stopping you from doing that. However, if you wanted to record a video of you doing that and then put it on YouTube, right. That's a, that's a different stick that you've now need to, that you've now encountered. So that's why I think, Copyright can get so confusing because every scenario is approached differently. I mean, there's a different process for getting permission to do a recording versus to do a video, you know, versus publishing sheet music. I mean, it's all over the place. But the basic fundamental principle is really easy. And that is, if it's not your song, you need to ask permission. When you, um, when you're working with your team, uh, this is more, I, I'm being nosy what what programs what what software what's your what's your team using to create your music what where are your what are your what are your golden tools that you would die without <laughs> yeah so i'm a finale guy 
Um, I have a, a MIDI controller that I use to input all of the the notes because the idea of using a number pad to to put in music just makes me crazy. I know there's <laughs> lots of people that are incredibly <laughs> fast with that and more power to them. I just, my brain doesn't work that way. Sure, sure. Um, I, I use a program called uh, Finale Jet Stream Controller. Um, that's a little, it's a little device uh, or uh, it's a, it's a hardware device uh, with, with little buttons that lets you uh, trigger like shortcuts in the program. There's also an app for it, um, which works if your internet connection is good. Um, and, and then um, I also use a program called Transcribe, another very creatively named de uh, uh, device, but basically it's just, it's just a little mini audio player that lets you slow down a song without changing the pitch. So it just it just makes it it just makes it easier when you have to figure things out by ear because you can slow it down, you can loop different sections, you can you know uh, take your time, and and it actually displays the waveform of the song, so it's a little easier to find where you are. You can just kind of click on a particular point in the audio file rather than having to try and scroll and guess like where was I. So I mean that's one I use all the time. Um, when I get into, uh, you know, more uh, production, I mean, I'm in Pro Tools or Logic, depending on who I'm working with. Um, and, and that's pretty much it. I mean, you need a good set of speakers. I like having a really big computer screen so that I can, you know, blow up my score and, and, and see all the different, um, you know, staves in, in more detail. But, but it's really kind of bare bones. I mean, that's one of the benefits, I think, of sheet music is there's very, very little cost to get going other than um a decent computer excellent that is so helpful it's always nice to know what what tools of the trade someone's using i have a more um uh and you can choose not to answer this if you don't want to uh because you have such a huge library of music are you relying on like an organization or a legal team or anyone to monitor the royalties coming in the short answer is no uh it definitely helps that my father-in-law is a CPA, so he can do all my taxes for me. That, the, I, <laughs> Thank I, you, father-in-law. Yeah, I lucked into that one. Um, the, the, the organizational piece, though, really is a challenge. Um, and I just have developed a color-coded Google Doc that I use to keep track of. It, that's, that's more to keep me on task, though, like which songs need to be uploaded and and... And, you know, where are the links to those songs? Uh, if I, if I'm going to share them on Facebook or something like that, like I will, I will, I have just a, a big Google sheet. That's all of the, you know, URL addresses to the different arrangements. That way, if somebody asks for something, I can go in there, find it, click, boom, you know, um, the great thing about using, um, arrange me or some of the other third party, uh, distributors is that they handle all of the financial stuff for you, right? So if you're selling on Arrange Me, or if you're so the, there's also uh, JW, JW Pepper has one called My Score, um, and then and then MusicNotes.com also has as a, a similar program. So when you're selling through one of those sites, they they handle all of the the royalties for you. Um, and to be frank, the majority of my sales come from those other places. I do sell a lot of music on my personal website. And, and when that happens, I just have to be really good about remembering to, um, you know, track and, 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 and <laughs> pay, you know, pay people what they're due. Um, <laughs> but you're right. I mean, organization is, a, is kind of an overlooked part of all of this because you do reach a certain point where you have so much stuff. And if you're not tracking that, things are just going to fall through the cracks. Right. Right. Um, do you have a favorite platform that you find easy to navigate that you just enjoy using more than others? Um, or can you answer that? Are you sponsored by anybody? Um, the thing about it is those platforms come with different customer bases. So it's not a question so much of how easy is it to use the service. It's more about who are they reaching. There's certain types of arrangements that I do 
you know, they'll sell like hotcakes on JW Pepper and get no traction on Sheet Music Plus. And it's, and it's all about where people are going to shop for their music. And so it's taken a little bit of, of experimenting to figure that out. But, um, I mean, it, it sounds, it sounds kind of, I mean, it sounds cliche, but you just kind of, you, you go where the money is, you know, like if, if you see that something is selling in a certain place, you keep doing that kind of thing. Right. Right. That's so helpful. Um, with the, what we were at the beginning of a new year, it's 2024, um, for you and your team, what are, what are, do you have some big projects coming up or some new, new focuses this year? Yeah. So the, the way show choir works is that during the winter semester, everybody is busy performing the music that I have just written. And so I have a couple of months to get caught up on everything, updating the website, putting out new material. Um, and then, you know, once, once June hits, I'm basically back into the, back into the sweatshop, uh, writing show choir music. So I'm working on, um, a new website for the podcast. That's going to make it a lot easier to find the, the information that we share on that site. Um, I'm also working on a new series of music for more traditional choral ensembles, uh, primarily pop arrangements that are more suited for a concert setting. I think there's kind of a stigma about it right now where uh, a lot of people will do, you know, sort of the, the, the cliche is the like fun pop song to end the concert. Right. And they don't really treat it like a serious piece of music. And so one of the things I'm trying to do is just really, um, figure out a way to write arrangements in a way that they're taken seriously as concert music, because especially with choral music, it's really all about the text. And as long as it's a good text, I don't think it matters one bit if the original writer was a pop star or, you know, a, a teacher at a middle school somewhere. Like it doesn't matter as long as the message is something that you think is worth singing. I think that's one of the things that makes vocal music so different from instrumental music is because you have that built in message and that meaning. And it's so obvious. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's nice, there's, there's, you can't, you can't escape the text, you know, no matter what mm. you do, like it's always going to be there right in the forefront. So that's kind of, uh, I've got a, I've got a few things in the works that are, hoping to sort of push that boundary a little bit. I love that. Um, Garrett, thank you so much for this really interesting conversation. It has been an absolute uh, education for me as a publisher talking to an arranger and some of the unique uh, venues and, and organizations that you're writing for. I want to thank you for the work that you're doing with uh, selling sheet music because uh, I know there's uh, a a, a a whole bunch of young composer arrangers that need that information. And I love how you're educating everybody and letting and sharing the wealth and letting everybody know how they can be successful. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Where can people find and follow you? Yes. So all my social media handles are at breeze tunes. Nice. So that's, that's Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. And then um, if you're a, if you're a choral person, GarrettBreeze.com is probably the easiest way to get at that music. And then if you are listening and wanting to get into the self-publishing space, uh, check out the podcast. Um, it's Selling Sheet Music. Um, it's on all of the major you know podcast platforms. Um, and yeah, you can always uh, send me a message through Facebook or Instagram. I'm always uh, I'll. I, I always try to keep on top of those messages as best as I can. <laughs> yes. Right. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to put links in the show notes to all of your, of all of your, uh, uh, channels. Thank you so much for being part of our show. Thank you. This was great fun and best of luck with everything that you're doing. Thanks. <laughs> A very special thank you to Garrett for that wonderful conversation. If you check our show notes, you can find all the links to all of the information that he shared, his website and his podcast. Please check it out. Selling Sheet Music is such a great podcast if you are creating your own music um, and or if you're working with young composers, arrangers or songwriters. Please make sure your students know about his podcast. My my 
my friends, do not forget about our live office hours coming up in March. We have the one, the only, Dr. Ginevra Williams, and she's going to be answering all your questions about voice change. So visit our website, fullvoicemusic.com. Sign up for our newsletter. You will be the first to know about registration. It's free. And for those of you that don't make it to the live recording of Live Office Hours, well, you can catch it on our YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe so that you get notification. All of that information is in the show notes. My friends, if you are listening to this podcast at time of release, it's February 2024. If you are in the Northern Hemisphere, it's cold and dark. And one of the best things you can do for your students is make them smile and laugh and have some fun in your studio. So with that, I am wishing you inspired teaching and happy singing.